waiting for the uh, half hour to arrive. I'll call this meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society to order. My name is Richard Conkle. I'm the society president. Do we have any first time visitors today? Seeing no hands going up, I guess you've all been here before. We're very glad to have you today. Um, today's May 1st, um, which is a day that has some various meanings to it over the years. Um, we're sort of halfway between the equinox and the, the solstice. So um, in pagan calendars, that caused it to be a holiday. And then Christian feasts were put on top of that, mostly the feast of um, St. Philip and St. James the Less. So you'll have a lot of people in German origin who are Philip, Jacob, this and that, and the other thing. And that's because of this day. They were probably born or named after someone who had the name Philip and Jacob, because Jacob is, of course, the German form of um, James. And also you have a lesser saint, St. Valperga. Some of you may have ancestors with that unusual name. It's a woman's name. And in certain parts of Germany, um, Valpurgisnacht is like a Halloween sort of thing. It's actually last night into today. And it has to do with between the solstice and the equinox. And of course, May Day and big parades in Red Square. And then here in um, the United States, Dwight Dav David Eisenhower said it was Law Day. So tomorrow I'm going to a luncheon for the lawyers because we celebrate the rule of law. So. Um, glad to have you here today. I don't think we have any minutes to be read today because our secretary is not here. So that will be deferred until the next meeting. So we will move on to the treasurer's report with uh, Margaret Berg as our treasurer. Okay, treasurer's report for April 2022. Balance at April 1st, $16,209.99. Receipts for membership renewals of $870, publication sale of $23, and donations of $75 for a total of $968 in receipts. Disbursements to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for sales tax July through December 2021 was $18.73. Miscellaneous mailing for publications of $3.82. And um, to myself, Margaret Berg as treasurer, uh, the purchase of toner cartridges for the printer and miscellaneous mailing of a publication was uh, $56.08 for a total of $78.73 in disbursements, leaving the cash balance at April 30th of $17,099.26. The membership for April uh, uh, was at 151, 151, and we so far have 24 renewals. And um, with the price increase where they can get uh, two years for uh, sixty dollars, we we've had two who who did renew for the two years. So, but they've just started coming in. This was the first. This last week was the first week I really had received um, very many of them. So that that's it. Thank you, Margaret. That report will be filed for audit. Um, next month, uh, our meeting is actually on the second Sunday, and that will be here, and that will be for the Henry James Young Award, and we have um, two recipients, uh, one who is with us today, Becky Ann Stein, and the other one is um, Cindy Hartman, Cynthia Hartman, who is deceased. She was a member of our board and did a lot of good work, so we hope you can all come to that event. Um, that should be a nice event on the second Sunday of June. Uh, also on that day, we have to hold our um, board elections. And I hope I have the slate right. Um, I am termed out. So um, Jonathan Stair, who is our current vice president, will be on for a two-year term as president. And then I will be on for a two-year term as vice president. And I believe the other one is one of our directors at large, which is Mr. Tom Gibson, who is present here today. And the treasurer is not on. 
and I don't think the secretary is on. However, we do need to, the secretary is on, but we need to replace the secretary because um, our current secretary is moving to the Chicago area to live around family. So um, that is the current slate of officers um, and that will remain open to a certain degree until the election. Um, however, if, if someone is um, running, they have to sort of let the person know ahead of time. It's not something where you come and, and say, oh, you're on the, the slate uh, at the last moment. So you have, they have to, you have to have approval of the person to, uh, to do that. Um, okay, so the next thing I think we'll have Nicole Smith from the Library and Archives of the York County History Center who will give us news of what's going on here. Hello everyone, good to see you all. Uh, just a few words about um, what's coming up at the History Center. Um, Although I, before doing that, I wanna thank everyone for coming and thank everyone at home. If you have questions at home to, for our speaker, please just put them in the chat um, or in the comments on Facebook. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the York County History Center YouTube channel. Coming up this Friday is Give Local York. It's a big fundraising day for local nonprofits. Uh, here at the History Center, we have a a number of activities, including uh, digital scanning and uh, ancestry.com um, availability for people. The library itself is not open on Friday. At our Agricultural Industrial Museum, we have a number of family activities. And in the evening at the Gates and Plow, we have a number of activities, as well as the dedication of a DAR marker at the Colonial Courthouse for the 250th anniversary of the country coming up in 2026. We do not have a second Saturday program. Our Civil War Roundtable May 19th speaker is Jerry Jones, and he'll be speaking about the geology of the Gettysburg campaign. And our All Vet speaker on May 25th is Phil Matt, who served in the Army uh, in the 1960s. So, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. At this time, we'll have Jonathan Stair, our vice president, come up, um, tell us about the next program a little bit, I already did, and uh, introduce today's speaker. Before I speak about the upcoming program, I just wanted to mention that um, as Nicole suggested, Friday is Give Local York. And if you are a person who supports the York County History Center, which I hope you are, if you make an online donation on Friday, it goes towards a special pool that allows the History Center to get even more money from that uh, campaign. So I would encourage you, if you've ever thought about donating to the History Center Friday, it would be a good time to do that and do it online. As Richard mentioned, our next program will be uh, Sunday, June the 12th in this room, It'll be the Henry James Young Awards program, which we will give uh, the awards to two very deserving people, um, Becky Ann Stein and Cindy Hartman. And I hope that uh, you'll come and um, honor these valuable, invaluable <laughs> volunteers. Uh, they both have contributed so much to our society. There will be no meetings over the summer, and our next program, which starts the next program year, will be August 28th. So it'll be the last uh, Sunday in August for beginning the next program year. And Richard is lining up some things for that. Our speaker today is Tyler Stump from the Pennsylvania State Archives. And I was trying to think about what I should say about Tyler, but probably the thing that you need to know the most and that the most sticks out in my mind, uh, he has worked at the State Archives since 2016. And when he came on board, one of his primary tasks, which he still does, is to work with state agencies to bring records into the archives and to make sure that the State Archives gets what they're supposed to get from various state agencies. And he was assigned the Department of Human Services as well as the Department of Corrections. And Tyler has been uh, dogged in going after those agencies to make sure we keep those records. And you can thank him for some of the records he's gonna be talking about today because uh, he has turned over many leaves to find patient records and inmate records that were thought to be in storage and beyond any ability to reach them. And so, 
Tyler's going to be talking today about state institutions and their records. If you want to know a little bit more about one of them, he did publish an article in Pennsylvania history about Farview State Hospital, which was a state facility for the criminally insane. And he might mention a little bit about that because he found some very interesting records there. So without further ado, I want to have Tyler come and speak to us. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the introduction, Jonathan. Uh, I had the good fortune to work with Jonathan for the last couple of years of his career at the State Archives, and we miss him every day in our reference room, at least I do whenever I'm out on the desk and I get a hard question about Pennsylvania history that I can't answer. Um, but it's very glad, I'm very glad to see you all today uh, and everyone who's online. Hello, I can't see you in person, but um, I'm glad you're here too. Um, I'm really glad to be here. My family is from the Dallas town, York Township area. So it's nice to have a chance to come back to like the mother county, I guess, and talk a little bit. Uh, my wife, Andrew and I, we live up in Harrisburg and I work at the Pennsylvania State Archives. Um, and like Jonathan said, my main job is an acquisitions archivist. So I'm going around the state visiting sometimes state hospitals or, or other facilities, um, identifying records that have historical or genealogical value and making sure they come back to the archives. Um, but because I have worked so much with state hospitals, I kind of have an, a more intimate knowledge of these records. Um, and so Jonathan asked me if I would just come here today to tell you all a little bit about maybe the types of records and just how, how you can locate family information in them. Um, records from state hospitals and other mental facilities in Pennsylvania, I think are some of the most underutilized and richest sources of information about individuals who sometimes have the most fragmentary record, historical record. Um, a lot of times these are folks who were marginalized in more ways than one. And so they're really hard to find in the kind of the official documentary record. Like they, it, it's a lot more difficult to find them than it would be other family members who may be found in more traditional avenues of, of records and things like that. Um, I also come to you as someone who has done this research myself. I've had uh, at least one family member who was institutionalized in New York State, and I had multiple family members on a couple of different branches of my family who were incarcerated in Pennsylvania. And I have found as many of their records as I think exist. So I've kind of, um, I've seen it from the archivist perspective, but also as a researcher, like some of you are. Um, so hopefully I'll cover kind of the length and breadth of that. But if we have any questions, uh, I know Nicole is gonna take them from online and then we've got a lot of folks here in the, in the room too. So we will, we'll answer them together. Okay, there we go. So just in case you've never been up to visit us in Harrisburg, uh, the Pennsylvania State Archives, we are right next to the Capitol building downtown, although we are in the process of building a new building. So we'll be moving just a couple of blocks away, hopefully next year. Um, so come and see us in our new exciting building. We were established in 1903, and we since then have been the official repository for all government records um, in the state of Pennsylvania that have historical value. And so that's where talking about all these state hospitals come in, comes into play. Uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania operated somewhere around 50 different mental institutions and what I call kind of adjacent types of facilities. So these would be state prisons, industrial workhouses, um, facilities for people who have intellectual disabilities. Um, I'm trying to think of what other ones, um, lots of other different kind of more specialized facilities, but all of them at one point or another would have institutionalized people who either were considered insane, who had different mental illnesses, who had what we would call today either learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, um, speaking disabilities, things of that nature. Um, so it's a lot of people from a lot of different places, but it all comes down to, it's all of the Pennsylvania State Archives. If it's a government run facility, we're gonna be your place to find that information. So it's a lot, um, I said before, and for those of you who are in the audience, I have a handout with a list of all the facilities um, and I'll share that with Nicole for our online, online audience, uh, but it's, it's a lot of places with hundreds of thousands of people that covers over 150 years of time. So we're talking about a massive collection of records. So I can't talk about everything today, I wish I could, but I thought I would kind of hit the highlights uh, and just give you a sense of if you're ever looking to do this kind of research, if you have a family member who was institutionalized at some point in the past in the state, um, where do you start or what kinds of information can you expect to find? Okay, so let's start with just a little bit of a history lesson, then we'll get into talking about the records more specifically. Before maybe the mid 1800s or so, 
uh, there were no mental institutions in Pennsylvania, or at least none that were run by the state. There were a few, you know, small specialized hospitals that may have had like a mental wing or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, people who today would be diagnosed with mental illness or an intellectual disability, most commonly would live at home with their family members, um, or in some cases when they didn't have anyone to care for them at home, uh, there wasn't really a social safety net like we'd have today. So they would typically be in a county prison, in a county poor home, an almshouse, something of that nature. Uh, and we know in York County, the York County almshouse was the, the destination for a lot of folks like this. Uh, and that's well documented. The records from that almshouse are at the York County archives just down the road from here. Um, so when you're looking for families, family members who may have been institutionalized, if you're looking before the 1850s, there's not really much that's out there anymore. But if there is something, I would suggest looking kind of at the local level. And um, that's not something that we'll find in the state archives, but it's just kind of interesting to note where that may be. In the 18th 40s, the famous activist Dorothea Dix traveled across Pennsylvania and she surveyed the conditions that people who were insane or had mental illnesses uh, had and where they were living. And so she visited the York County Jail and Alms House in 1844 and reported the conditions there. And she said that York County did a better job than most counties uh, in how they were treating people or the kind of the housing that they had. And I have part of a quote up here on the screen, but I'll read the full section that she wrote. Um, and she, here she is writing about the York County Alms House, and she said, the cells for the insane are in the basement of the hospital building. There is grating over the doors, three by one and a half feet. In winter, warmed by a stove and pipes conducting near all the cells. The supply of water is ample, provisions wholesome and sufficient. Comfortable as the insane are here by comparison with most of this class in poor houses, though some wear chains and hobbles. They receive all the medical attendance that can possibly be rendered to their situation but the recoveries are few. And so she was saying that most people who were in an almshouse or a prison who was insane, they're just being housed there basically. They're not receiving treatment that's leading to any sort of improvement so that they can go back and return to their community, their family or anything like that. Um, they're just kind of living there and they probably would be for the rest of their lives. And Dix estimated that there were about a hundred people living in York County who were insane at the time. Uh, and she also visited Adams County and Franklin County, and she described those places with more or less a, a pretty similar report that she had. This report that she, this quote comes from was actually submitted to the state legislature in 1850 and helped, and she petitioned the government, and that actually led to the creation of the first state-run institution in Harrisburg, which is uh, more recently known as Harrisburg State Hospital in 1851. And so since then, the state has opened over 50 institutions all over the state, and I have a map of them here. Um, so the state archives is that kind of red star there. So York County is just south of that. There were no state run institutions in York County, but there were several close by in Lancaster, in Franklin County, up in Dauphin County and Harrisburg, um, as well as others kind of closer to the Philadelphia area or in the central parts of the state. So as you can see, it's a lot of different institutions. Um, most of these were what's called state hospitals, and so these are intended to be a living place for Pennsylvanians who would have various mental illnesses um, and, and psychiatric disorders. And then they've operated what are now called state centers, which are places that have housed people with intellectual disabilities or epilepsy um, or other things of that nature. So they've kind of differentiated these institutions into two groups, the state hospitals and the state centers. Um, and so there are hundreds of thousands of people since the 1850s who have lived in all these places kind of as a whole. State hospitals and other institutions served several different purposes over the centuries, but in general, they were intended to be a place where people would receive proper medical care or just whatever sort of treatment or care that they needed to help cure their conditions so that they could return back to their homes and their communities. Uh, but I think it would also be kind of, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't note uh, that there's evidence that a lot of times this wasn't the case, where we know that there's a lot of reports of abuse and neglect, and a lot of people just simply lived there, and they just kind of remained there for long periods of time, um, whether it was because of misdiagnosis, and they were not actually insane or didn't actually have a mental illness, um, or they just weren't receiving the proper medical and uh, kind of um, the other types of care that they needed. So it's just something to mention, uh, but that's um, that's just kind of, that was the the purpose in creating these institutions. And so when family members are you know, sending family, other members of their family to an institution, 
Um, that's kind of what they're thinking about or what their intention is. Okay, so before I get into talking about what is at the State Archives, I want to just first start and talk about what is not at the State Archives, just to make sure that we don't give anyone the wrong impression about anything. Um, the State Archives is the go-to place for the records of most of these institutions that I've talked about, all the ones that were run by the state in Pennsylvania. Uh, but for the most part, you won't find records that were created by people who were institutionalized themselves. So if you have you know, a great-great-grandmother who was at Harrisburg State Hospital, you're not really going to find letters and other things that she herself wrote. You're going to find records that physicians wrote about her or administrators wrote about that person. So we don't really have the perspective of family members or ancestors who were institutionalized in the past. We also don't have much from um, you know, other family members or advocates or other people. Most of what we have is created from the government perspective of things. Also, we don't really have any records that come from any other levels of government. So like I said before, talking about the York County Almshouse, those records are not going to be at the State Archives. They're going to be here in York County, either at the York County History Center, or I think those ones are at the York County Archives. Um, but just in general, if you're looking at other counties in the state and you're looking at a family member who might have been in an almshouse or a poorhouse over there, that's not going to be at the State Archives. Also, um, just for kind of chronologically, the bulk of our collections go from about the 1850s up through the 1980s or so. So we don't really have much from kind of the present day of records. Um, so just when you're looking for stuff, if something is much more recent, um, we're typically not gonna be the place to find that. But in general, um, anything before that, we're probably gonna be the place that will have that. Okay, depending on when an ancestor was institutionalized and what their diagnosis was, they could have been several different places in the state. Um, and this would be whether your ancestors from York County, from Adams County, or if they're from any other part of the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, there was never one single state-run institution that somebody from a certain geographic area would always go to. So just for example, if you're from York County, it's not like you'll always go to one particular institution. But typically, the most the geographically closest institution to where somebody is living is where they're going to be institutionalized in general. Not always, but in general. Um, if you're unsure where an ancestor may have been institutionalized, if maybe you just had people in the family who said, we know there was somebody, we, we know this person in our family was at a state hospital once, but you don't know where they were. Um, census records are usually a really good place to kind of start your search. If somebody is living in a state hospital or another facility during the time when the census is taking, it's going to list that institution as their place of residence. Um, so a lot of times that's a really good way to start. Sometimes death certificates, if a family member or an ancestor died while they were at an institution, it's going to list where they were um, as their place of last place of residence. Sometimes newspaper records from the 1800s and early 1900s will also mention that, but that can be hit or miss. Uh, but that's, you know, sometimes it's a good place to start if you're unsure. I was looking in the archives this weekend for anything that I could find from kind of York and Adams County. Uh, and I found a couple of letters I just wanted to kind of share and read real quick. Um, they're a little hard to make out on the screen. I couldn't really get a great scan that the ink is kind of faded, but we, um, you know, there's plenty of people from the York and Adams County area uh, who were institutionalized over the centuries and who did end up in state run institutions. The first one I have here is from a son who lived in Gettysburg, who was writing to uh, Harrisburg State Hospital asking about his mother and he wrote I sent by two day express a little box to mother. Please have it handed to her on Christmas morning. May I ask you to write me on its receipt. It contains a few apples, oranges, and such confectionery as used to suit her tastes. And he also sent $5 in this letter that he had sent in 1882. And the other letter, which is a little more faded on the back is from somebody who's living in New York City. And they wrote to a physician who was also at Harrisburg State Hospital. Uh, asking about their daughter and he wrote, please tell me soon how she is and does. Does she ever speak of home or does she ever say anything about going to church? You know, she is a Catholic girl. Will you please tell me, does ever the Catholic clergyman visit the hospital? And if so, please tell him from me to speak to Mary and tell her who she is. She is a good girl. And so I, I think that's just something else that's really interesting, but family was a really important thing for people who were institutionalized. And we get a lot of evidence from that whether it's from the few letters and things like that that remain where people are constantly asking about family members because it wasn't easy to go up and visit all the time. Or from more recently, we have you know um, family members who are writing to the state, they're writing to the governor's office and saying, 
Um, I have questions about the care that my son or my cousin or my aunt is receiving. Um, and so that's something that's really important to them. So I just think that kind of links us to talking about doing family history where just this family element is a really important thing when it comes to the lives that these people live in different institutions. Okay, so I will be the first to admit, and I, if any of you have ever done this research on your own before, finding records for individuals can be a challenge. I mentioned we have a huge volume of records. Uh, it can really be a needle in a haystack search a lot of the time. Um, not to say it can't be done, and we, you know, Jonathan, when he was at the State Archives, and I myself have helped tons of people find their family members who are at these state hospitals, but there's a few things that um, I think are important to know up front when you're starting a search or you're starting to look. The state hospitals system or these kind of institutions were operated kind of like a big network in the state. And we know that people may have been admitted to one hospital first, but then later they were transferred to other ones. And so they kind of moved around the state um, depending on either if their diagnosis changed, if their medical or sometimes even their financial situations changed, sometimes requests from family members. And so I have up here on two examples. Uh, the first is a man named Harry Morton Smith, who was at an institution called Pennhurst State School and Hospital in the Philadelphia area. Originally, he was admitted to the Pennhurst State School in, I think, around 1905 or so. Um, after eight, let me see, I have it in my notes. After spending a couple of years at Pennhurst, he returned home to live with his family for a few years. And then a few years after that, we have records that say he was admitted to Harrisburg State Hospital in Dauphin County. And so that's, you know, 100 plus miles away. And after a few more years after that, he was transferred from Harrisburg to Wernersville State Hospital, which is out by Reading. And he later, he lived the rest of his life at that institution. So this is one person, but he has records at three separate institutions. So again, that can be a challenge for research. The other guy I have here on the screen, he's the fellow who's in the picture on the, on the right side of the screen, Lewis Henry Ross. Originally, we know as a juvenile or as a teenager, he was uh, arrested and sent to the Huntington Industrial Reformatory in Huntington County. Uh, after he served his time there, he went back to his home in Pittsburgh. He was later arrested and served time at Western State Penitentiary. And then later at his physician's um, advice, he was transferred from Western to Farview State Hospital, which is a mental institution up in Wayne County, up in the northeast part of the state, where he remained for about 30 years or so. So again, just one person, multiple institutions, the records are spread out and they're kind of spread out over lots of different places. Uh, with Lewis Ross, his records were also in the court system. So that's a fourth place where we had to find records. Um, so again, when you're researching an individual who's institutionalized, be prepared to look in many different places because uh, that's just something you'll find the fuller story when you look in all the different places. Okay, so in the time that I've left, I'd like to talk about the actual records that are in the archives. So what you can expect when you come and visit us one day, because I hope you all will. Uh, from every institution, for the most part in Pennsylvania, we have a variety of administrative records that were created, usually by the superintendent and other administrative staff who were at that hospital. Uh, and these might include things like correspondence and letters, policy documents, reports, uh, meeting minutes, and those sorts of things. And these records, um, you, we have a lot of them, especially from like the late 1800s, early 1900s. They're very candid and they tell you a lot about what it was like to live at an institution. And I, I just think these are important because I know a lot of you were interested in researching a family member, an ancestor, but sometimes when we find the records, it'll just tell us they were admitted on this day, they, lived, they stayed at the hospital for this many years, and then they were discharged. And looking at these administrative records, they kind of tell us what was the experience like. If you have a family member who was at Harrisburg State Hospital in 1920, what was that like at that time period? And so looking at these reports, looking at what the physicians are writing about general treatment, pop prep, practices and procedures, uh, it can really kind of fill in the, the meat of kind of understanding what a family member's experiences were actually like that you won't see in just an individual medical file or something like that. So again, that's something we have tons of these. Uh, it varies from one place to another, but it's a really good resource that we have um, at the State Archives. Okay, but the thing I know we're most interested in is going to be the records of individuals. Um, and so uh, I most of the time, these records in the archives, they're called patient records. So that's kind of the, the terminology that's used um, on the records themselves. So that's what I'll refer to them as. Um, so sometimes, and that, that's actually a good thing that I should mention, it can be hard to read these records, whether they have kind of antiquated medical terminology, 
or just the fact that people writing, they're very kind of cold and clinical. So, you know, it may be hard for us to read today what they're saying about a family member. And for them, it's just kind of a matter of fact routine, a business thing. It's like, this is what I do every day, just talking about this. Um, so it's just something to kind of be aware of that um, just the ways they're writing about people is gonna be different from what you would see in other kind of historical or genealogical uh, documents and things like that. Anyways, the main types of records that we have in the archives, I have them listed in four, kind of four categories. Um, admission and discharge records is the first one. The second one is what's called master patient in card indexes. The third one are patient case files. And the last one is cemetery and burial records. And these four categories of records, they have, some of them have more or less information in them about individuals. And then also just what we have in the state archives. Um, some of these records are more fragmentary than others. So sometimes a family member may show up in one or two of these categories, but not in another. We may find their admission record but we might not find their case file, or we may find a case file and they don't have a card index, or they didn't show up in the cemetery record, even though we think they may have died at the institution. So um, between these four categories, that's where we're gonna find the information. So I'd like to go through each of these in detail and just give you a little more information about what to expect in each of these different uh, categories of records. Okay, first one, admission and discharge. Actually, it's on this page. So admission and discharge records are usually compiled in large ledger books, and they were written in table form. So it's kind of the, the old version of a database, if you will. Um, on each line, there will be a name and basic information about an individual. And this will be where they're from, what their diagnosis was at the time, the date that they were admitted or they were discharged from the institution. Um, sometimes it'll have maybe just list one family member or like who they were committed by to the institution. Um, and sometimes a few other pieces of information like that. Um, so this is kind of our basic record. Um, most of the times, every state hospital would have these in ledger form. So we have almost all of them at the state archives. So from when an institution opened all the way up to when it closed or if it's still open to the present day. Um, and some of these we have scanned, we have them available on the website, although not all of them just because they're really fragile and hard to scan. Here is a scan of one from Harrisburg State Hospital. This ledger is from 1861, and it's a little bit hard to make out, um, but if you're looking at this on the computer, you can zoom in, it's a little bit easier to read. Um, but it, it literally just each, each line on here is a separate person. So it's got, looks like it has their name, their patient number, their age. Um, I can't read all these, they're a little fuzzy, but where they're from, and then just a couple of other pieces of information like that. So it just kind of goes along the line. So it's not a lot of information, but it's a start. So once we find this, we know when they were admitted, we know what their patient number is, which is kind of a tracking number that's gonna be on all of their other documents. Then we kind of, we have more information we can use to kind of continue our search. Um, so this is kind of a good baseline. I would say anybody who is institutionalized in the state, we're probably gonna find an admission or discharge record like this. So this is at the very least what we can usually expect to find for anyone uh, who is institutionalized in Pennsylvania. Okay, let's see. Okay, next one. The next one I wanna talk about is they're called master patient card indexes. Sometimes different institutions have different names for these, but I, I like to call them card indexes. Uh, and what these are, are big collections of cards in alphabetical order, one for each patient. And they were used by medical record staff to uh, quickly track down an individual and their basic information. So. It's created for just kind of day-to-day -day record keeping purposes, but luckily we have them in the archives and they are um, a, a valuable thing for genealogy and other things like that. It's a lot easier to find people because they're alphabetical. And so we don't have to know what somebody's number is or when they were admitted or anything like that. There's more information on these cards and I'll show an example of one in a moment. Um, there's more information on these than what you would find in an admission or a discharge ledger. Um, although we've found, and Jonathan can tell you the same, sometimes cards are missing. You know, sometimes it's just we'll be going through and an individual card is missing. Sometimes it's a chunk that was, we, we don't know why. They're just, they're missing for some reason. And sometimes when these collections are, you know, 50, 70, 100 years old, it's hard to say why cards may have gone missing at one point or another. Uh, but just suffice to say, sometimes there's gaps in the record. And so um, usually we're pretty successful in finding people, but sometimes, um, you know, if we come back and say we can't find somebody, that's something just to expect. Here is an example of what one of those cards would look like. This is from Mayview State Hospital, which is an institution over in Allegheny County near Pittsburgh. 
Um, so as you can see, there's a lot more information here. It's got the guy's name, his address, um, his nativity. So this person was from Austria, his age, got his occupation. It has the names of his relatives. So it's got his father's name. Um, it says this was the first time that he was admitted to this hospital. Sometimes people would be admitted and then discharged and admitted again at a point in the future. Um, you know, it has other things here. It says that he also was at St. Francis Hospital, which is also in Pittsburgh um, in the past. And then I'll scroll over. this is also the back of the card. Usually they're more filled out than this one, but um, it has the maiden name of his mother. It has here information that he did improve by the time he was discharged from the, the facility in 1919. Um, if he had passed away at the hospital, would have had information at the bottom saying why he died, where he was buried, those sorts of things. So we've got a lot more information here that we can find, um, especially for people who don't have family members who may not have records anywhere else. And sometimes we'll find people, you know, say he was buried in a pauper's grave or he was, um, you know, cremated, the body was donated for medical research, which was something that happened for a lot of um, indigent people who didn't have family members at the time. Um, so that can be kind of the only record that helps us locate where somebody is who we don't have any other records for them. So again, a very useful thing, um, but sometimes they're missing, so we don't always have this. Okay, the last one in this section is um, what's called a patient case file. And these are probably the, the richest sources of information we have, but they're also the most fragmented sometimes. Um, these are fuller files for individuals that have detailed information on their full admission process, their full diagnosis and their time at the institution, if they had any kind of work assignments or they were involved in like social things. Um, and that could be, you know, they participated in plays at the institution or they had a baseball team that they were on. Um, they worked in the laundry room or something like that. Um, they had a medical procedure, they broke their arm one day. And so they were treated for that. Um, it lists sometimes if they have visitors or if they left to go on kind of like a paroled visit somewhere else. We have a lot of people who it says like, you know, their family came and picked them up and they went to Harrisburg for the day or something like that. Um, so there's a lot more information. It tells us a lot about their experiences. So again, it's a very rich source of information. Um, they also have information that's kind of just like very medical kind of stuff. So again, there's a lot of medical terminology in there, but it gives you a much um, more detailed sense of what their experience was like on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. This is an example of one from Pennhurst State School and Hospital, which is in the Philadelphia area. Um, and this young man who, it's a little bit faded on the side, but he did not have any known family members. He was basically living on the streets in Philadelphia. In the corner, it just says he was brought here by a couple of people who said he lived in the neighborhood, but they didn't know his mother or father's name. And then it goes on to talk a little bit about um, kind of his experiences on the, the other page that I didn't scan. There's an interview with a social worker who knew him. So she's talking a little bit about what they knew about him before he came to the institution. Luckily on this one, we've got a photograph, which is really great. Uh, not every case file will have a photo, but um, some from this period will. So again, there's a lot more in here and it's a really great record to have. Um, however, not every institution saved these because they were really bulky records and they just didn't have the space to save all these. So some institutions would microfilm them so the quality of the photographs and things like that are not gonna be quite as detailed, but at least we've got the information. Other places, and I hate to say it, but you know, in the 50s and 60s, sometimes they purge these records. They said, this person hasn't been in the institution for 30 years, we don't need this record anymore, and they got rid of it. And I hate that that happens. Um, luckily, we've been able to recover a lot of them that, that um, were just sitting in storage in different places. Uh, but just, I just wanna make sure we all understand just because you have a family member and we know that they were at an institution, we might have them on the census record. Their death certificate might say they were at a state hospital. If you come to the archives, we're not going to have a case file like this for every person. Um, I, I wish that we did. And a lot of times we do find them, but I just don't want to set you up to be disappointed when we can't find something um, at one point or another. But like I said, this case file, when we do have them, this is the best source of information for an individual who is at a state hospital. Okay, the last category I just wanna talk about really quickly. Some institutions would have cemeteries on their grounds and they were usually reserved for individuals who died there and either no families would claim the body or if they had died of a contagious disease so they didn't wanna transport the body elsewhere. Um, a lot of people who died in the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic are usually buried on the grounds and so we have lots of records of those. Um, so that's just something, it, it can be hit or miss if you know that a facility has a cemetery. Um, 
we can be a source of information for that. If an institution had a cemetery, historically, they would not put names on the gravestones. They would usually put a patient's number or a burial number on the cemetery or on the gravestone rather, which can make it very difficult to find those people. But thankfully, we have some records in the archives, which are burial listings, which will say who is in each grave plot. Um, so we do have that. I did also want to note real quick, typically these cemeteries that do exist, um, it's important to find out who owns the cemetery and maintains it today because they're not always just open to the public. You might need to call ahead um, if you have a family member who's buried there. So that's just something to um, know before you go because you don't want to show up and then not be able to get in. That would be uh, not fun, not as much fun. Uh, but here on this screen, I have an example from Woodville State Hospital, which is over in the Allegheny County area. And this is a listing of every plot in the cemetery and everyone who's buried in every single spot. Um, so this is, to my knowledge, the only document that tells us who is buried where. So State Archives is a great place to find that information if you think you have an ancestor who was buried at a state hospital, also a state prison, also any kind of other facility in the state. Okay, so other records besides those patient records, I already mentioned administrative records. We have a few other sorts of things. Sometimes it can be hit or miss, just depending on what was saved at a state hospital or an institution. Sometimes we have photographs and films that show what life was like, which are really interesting when we have those. Sometimes we have newsletters, which were written by patients. And so they will talk about events that are going on at the institution um, or something else of that nature, which are always fun to read. Sometimes there will be correspondence to the governor or other state officials. And those will be from family members who are inquiring about loved ones who are at the institution. Um, sometimes we have audits and inspections, which on their face are you know, kind of very technical and boring government documents, but they tell you a lot about the hospital. They will tell you what food was being purchased and was served in the cafeteria. They will tell you what toys were bought if there were children there who were you know, in the playroom. Um, it'll tell you, you know, what the furniture was like that they had available. It's just anything you can imagine, um, it, the information is in these. So it just kind of gives us a much richer sense of what an experience is like for an ordinary person in an institution. And I wanted to show a couple of my favorite photographs that we have. Uh, both of these come from an institution out in Western Pennsylvania. The first one on the left, it's not labeled, but it's somebody who looks like he was allowed to keep his cat with him at the state hospital. So I really love that one. And the other is a group of children who were institutionalized and they were going for a ride on the grounds in a pony cart. Um, also looks like a lot of fun. That one is actually a hand colored or a hand tinted photograph, uh, which was a fun find when we got that into the archives. Um, so like I said, Patient records are going to be where we find the most about our specific ancestor, but we also have lots of records that tell us more about generally what was their experience going to be like. Okay, so um, before I put this page away, so you're probably thinking to yourself by now, this is great. The archives has all this information. You know, I think I have a family member who was at an institution once, so I'd love to go there and find out. Uh, and so I think that's great, and I hope that you will come and visit us. But I want to kind of give you some information before you come and visit us um, just about accessing these records at the state archives. Right now, any non-patient records that we have at the archives, so that would be photographs, reports, correspondence, those sorts of things, they're all open for research with no restrictions on them. Anybody can come in them and look at them at any time. But due to state law, any records that we have that have patient or medical information in them, we do have to restrict them from public access if they are 75 or less years old, or if the individual in the record has been deceased for less than 50 years. And so that just, that goes right up to state law. There's nothing we can really do about that. So again, we're only able to grant access to records that are 75 years or older, or if we have some kind of proof that the individual has been deceased for more than 50 years. So um, if, that, if those amounts of time haven't passed, really the only people who can see those records is that individual if they're still alive, or if you're the executor of that person's estate. So that's kind of in the legal realm of things. Um, so if you're not sure, you can always give us a call and we can help figure out um, if the records are open or not, but just, I wanna make sure we all understand, you can't just walk into the archives and see any record. I wish you could, um, but that's just not the, the case. Um, I would always recommend calling ahead just to verify that a record will be open before you come. Cause like I said, we'd hate to have to say, well, the record's here, but it's closed. So um, just something to be aware of. Okay. Um, also, if you are not able to visit, visit us in person, um, we have reference archivists who are able to help over phone or email. 
but just knowing as much or sharing as much information about your ancestor so that we can do a good search and make sure we're finding them uh, is going to be really helpful. Um, and so I definitely encourage knowing information about your ancestor. What is their full name? What are they going to be listed in the patient records as? What are their birth and death dates? Usually a patient record has somebody's date of birth, so we can use that to verify that we've got the right person. Um, looking for my own family, the Stump family, there are a lot of Stumps in Pennsylvania. And so making sure I found the right Jacob Stump was a, a struggle at some points, but since I knew his birth date, I knew I had the right one at different points. Um, knowing roughly when they may have been admitted or discharged from the hospital, if you know that, that's a helpful thing. Um, knowing what, where they lived at the time they would have been admitted. Um, so usually what county or what town or city they were from is going to be helpful. Um, if you know what their patient number is by any chance, that's a helpful thing. Sometimes it's listed on a death certificate um, or listed in a census record sometimes. Um, the name of the institution, if you know where they were at. And then also um, any kind of proof of death, a death certificate, a, no, a published obituary, something like that. Um, something so that we know that the person's been deceased for 50 or more years so that that record will be open. So those are those kinds of things um, to kind of have that on hand before you're coming to the state archives or if you're calling us or anything like that, I would definitely recommend that. So I'm gonna kind of wrap up there just with this presentation, but I'm, I'm hoping we've got a couple of questions, um, but I've got my contact up here on the screen. Please, please, please give me a call if there's anything that's on your mind, or if you're ever curious about looking for an ancestor who might have been in a state institution, um, we are bringing in more records to the archives as I can find them around the state and drive them over to Harrisburg. Um, so if we don't have a family member today, we may have them in the future. I hope we will. Uh, but um, yeah, so I'll wrap up there. But um, thanks all for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions that we have. Yeah. Maybe a little bit specific. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a great great grandmother who spent like 20 years or so her death, and Don helped me get the records back in 1993. Oh, a long time ago, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, it looked like what he got at that time were medical records from the admissions and that sort of stuff. The medical records that were kept in volumes that might have gone from one volume and then they would go to another one. Mm -hmm. Since that time, have other records come in? She lived in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. Other records come in that might be available. Um, like 1899. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, we have gotten some Harrisburg records since then, because I know when Harrisburg State Hospital closed in 2008, we brought in a lot of stuff after that. Um, so definitely check back with us because we probably do. And those records would all be open because it's old enough. So uh, I was very interested in the picture. Yeah, and we've got a period. yeah, we've got a lot of great photographs from Harrisburg State Hospital from that time period. Um, it was hard to pick just one, but there were at least a hundred or so that we had from that period. So. That's what is just vacant now, though. Yeah, Harrisburg State Hospital. Some of the buildings are still being used for government offices. Um, others are derelict. There's so much asbestos in the walls that you can't really put anyone in them anymore. Um, so I, I think I heard they're trying to sell some of the property, so I don't know what will happen with it, but right now, yeah, you can go up and walk around in Harrisburg and the buildings are beautiful, seeing them from the outside, but yeah, not much has happened there anymore. Jonathan, did you want to add something? Well, I, was say, I think Harrisburg was using volumes for the medical records until about 1920 or 24, and then they okay. shifted to, uh, then they shifted to loose files. Okay. But when the hospital closed, well, long the hospital closed, they moved the College of Heart Disease Hall, they moved the records to Danville and purged them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was told, I never saw this before, but I was told they only kept the call of Jackson, which is basically the folder mm -hmm. that the files were in. So they had to clear out the rest of the, the files up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. was, but we got to see the records for that hospital closed. Mm -hmm. They were about Four or five rooms this size mm -hmm. is packed That's full awesome. of files. Yeah. They, the archives have no way to hit all the files at that time, and the department didn't want to store them and throw that back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just for anyone who's listening online, we were talking about, uh, we had someone who's had an ancestor at Harrisburg State Hospital in the 1880s, 1890s, so just asking what other kinds of records. Um, and yeah, Har Harrisburg State Hospital did 
each hospital was kind of allowed to keep records in its own as they preferred. So that it wasn't like there's one rule, everyone must keep things in the ledger books or in you know, single sheets of paper or anything like that. They kind of operated as they all saw fit. Um, but with Harrisburg, yeah, they kept things. I think what we looked at as kind of those case files, so the one that had the photograph of the guy on it, they kept those also in ledger form. So they would just have you know, a, a giant leather bound book and there would just be a couple pages for each person. And they would just write entries in for them until they were discharged or they died. Um, and so that would be for Harrisburg, we would find people. Um, although in the 1920s, they shifted to doing paper files and just older records are usually, they take up less space. And then as you go forward in time, just because of kind of the, the advance of medical you know, science, um, once we, especially when we get to like the Medicare era, there's just a lot more records. Every time somebody has a prescription drug that they're taking, every time they're x-rayed for something, every time they have a routine checkup, it generates paperwork. And that, you know, becomes lots. I've seen some places where a single individual will have an entire filing cabinet of records. And we're talking about a place that has 3000 people at any given time living there. It's a lot of records. So with Harrisburg, yeah, when they closed, they transferred the records to another facility nearby in Danville for storage. Um, a lot of those records are still there and I'm hoping we'll pull them into the archives at some point when we're able to accommodate the space, although that's a battle that I'm still fighting. Um, but yeah, needless to say, if you've ever been to the state archives in the past and it's been a while, please come back or check with us again because we might have more that we didn't in the past. So that was a very long answer to your very short question, but um, yeah, please do check out with us again. Did you have a question? I did. Mm, that's a good question. So we had a question about tuberculosis sanitariums. A lot of them were operated by the state. Uh, and I know that there was one in Mount, Mount Alto or Alto. Um, there's one up in Hamburg, so not too far away from here. Typically they were run by the state. Sometimes they were operated at the county level. Although the other thing that gets a little more complicated is a lot of times once the facility shut down, it was no longer a tuberculosis sanitarium the state would kind of reopen it as something else. And so we have multiple places where it was originally a sanitarium, it closed, then the state took over the property and then started it as an, a state hospital or a facility with people with intellectual disabilities or something like that. Um, but typically they were either run by the state starting in like 1900 or so, or there are a couple that would have been run by the county, whatever county it was in. But the records from those do not survive nearly as well as state hospitals. Some do, um, so definitely reach out and we could, I can let you know what I'm aware of that exists. Um, but people stayed at them for a much shorter amount of time. It wasn't like these state hospitals were like somebody's living for many years. They typically stayed until they were cured and then they left. Um, and so the records that do survive, it's gonna be more like those ledger books, just a very brief, this is when they came in, did they improve or not? And this is when they left, so. Uh, but that's a good question. That's lots of different kinds of facilities. Mm -hmm. Some of the official records of history of history, not that we're Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I would say from what we have from maybe the 1890s up through the, maybe the World War II era, that's probably the richest that I'm aware, we have the most records that document how hospitals were operating, um, audit reports and things like that. The most has survived from that period that we have, um, you know, kind of that 50 year period, like the first half of the 20th century. Um, and that's all totally open. So I would definitely encourage you to come out and get your hands on it. Not a lot. Um, if you go to our, if you go in the state archives, we have, it's called the Power Library. And so it's a thing we run with the Pennsylvania State Library. And we are in the process of digitizing our entire microfilm collection, which is a collection of about 40,000 reels of microfilm. So it's a lot. Uh, it's taking a while, but we are up, constantly uploading stuff. So if we ever microfilm something in the past, we're digitizing that and we're putting it up. So it's not everything but it was typically things that had a high volume of genealogical reference. So with the state hospitals, not everything is up because we can only put up a reel of microfilm if the most recent record is more than 75 years old. So that kind of limits it. But we do have a couple of admission records, a few things like, um, things like listing of clothing that belong to different 
patients when they were admitted. So like how many shirts and things that they own because they needed to account for that. Um, and a few other things of that nature. So we have some things, but it's not a lot. But if you go to the Pennsylvania Power Library website and you look for the state archives page, that will um, tell you what we have that's available digitally. Yes. I guess I'm thinking that that's the Eastern State Penitentiary. That's a little bit. Yeah. Some of that stuff I think is on ancestry. Yes. Right now, right? Yep. That's correct. Yeah. Stuff that we have from Eastern and Western State Penitentiary, that's all been digitized. There's no restrictions on any of those records. Um, there's no laws that limit what kind of inmate records can go online. So as far as I'm aware, maybe not every single thing that we have from Eastern and Western is online, but yeah, the vast majority. Also, um, yeah, there's several other kinds of inmate records that are also online as well. And I know Jonathan, you, that people use that all the time. That's one of our more popular collections. So. What's online is not everything. What do you got? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Online's a great place to start and do some stuff from home. Um, but I would hate for somebody just to think that they found everything and just the rest of the story just is missing. Um, even if we're not able to find it, we may be able to point you to something else that might at least fill in or answer some other questions. So please do call us, that's our job. So <laughs> give us a call. Nicole. We do have one question online okay. about access. Looks like someone is in secular. I wonder what kind of proof they would need to access the system. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so just for everyone here in the room, somebody, is asking online, they are the executor of an individual's estate, so they'd like to see their records. Um, I think, you know, I don't work in our reference department, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, I, I would just recommend get in touch with our reference department, um, and it's just that their email is right up on our website, and so is their phone number. Uh, but just get in touch with them and just tell them that you're the executor, and then they would tell you if there's a certain type of legal document that you would need proving that. Um, but it should be a pretty simple process, but uh, I'm not sure exactly what they need. Um, but if Jonathan. The person is an executor, all we need are the letters of administration okay. that appoint that person to the executor. Okay, Jonathan is saying the letters of administration. And, and, and a copy of the death certificate. And a copy of the death certificate. You call it a short certificate. Okay, yeah, a yeah, short certificate. certificate. Okay, certificate. okay, great. Yeah. I'm glad we have some legal people in the room because I am not. <laughs> okay, we have any other questions online, Nicole? Okay. Anything else on our minds for everyone who's in the room? Jonathan. Tyler, could you explain if somebody goes to the website, how they would find what's going to be in the records? Oh, the finding aids. Yeah, that's a good point. I probably should have mentioned that before. <laughs> um, if you go on the Pennsylvania State Archives website, there will be a link that says search online. And there will be, I think just there's a link from there to our finding aids. And so the finding aids are what we have is it's not digitized records. So you won't see the records. It's kind of like a catalog listing of what we have. And so the vast majority of the records that we have from the state hospital system, because we have everything organized by the Department of the Government of the Commonwealth um, that operated these places. So today, what is called the State Department of Human Services operates all these facilities. In the past, it was called the Department of Public Welfare. That was their name up until about 10 years ago. Actually, before that, it was the Department of Welfare. Before that, it was the Board on Public Charities. And before that, it was the Commission on Lunacy. So it's gone through many different names over the centuries, I guess, since the 1880s or so. But if you look for Department of Human Services records, um, it should be listed under there. State hospitals are under what's called the Office of Mental Health. State centers are under what's called the Office of Mental Retardation. And so they're just, you're going to see an entry for it. It'll say Harrisburg State Hospital. And you can click on it, and it'll show you every single type of record. So it'll say, admission records, superintendent's correspondence, audit reports, photographs, films, whatever else. And I think from some of these hospitals, it's a lot. I mean, you'll see maybe 20 or 30 different groups of records. So there is a lot and it can be hard to kind of look through it all, but it's, it's all listed there. So you'll at least see what we have and how much of it that we have. Um, so that's, yeah, if you go on the Pennsylvania State Archives website, which I've got the link right up here on the screen, phmc.pa.gov, um, and you navigate through, look for Department of Human Services records, and that's where it'll be listed. Or if you just want to send me an email, I can show you exactly where it is. 
because I look through this like every day because I need to find certain things. So I know my way around it pretty well. So. Well, if there's nothing else, I will thank you again for your time and taking the time to listen to this. And please, I really do mean it. If there's anything, if you've got any questions about this, um, please do send me an email. Even if you're looking for folks who are in other states, just because I've worked with enough people who are looking for institutionalized people anywhere. And so I could, might just be able to help point you in the right direction um, or anything like that. So please do feel free to hit me up sometime. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.